Now to get a sense of what is happening on the southern border and how officials and the legal system are dealing with Title 42, we're joined by Claudia Rodriguez, a member of the City Council in El Paso, Texas, and immigration attorney Alan Orr, Jr. Thank you to you both for joining us this morning. Uh, Claudia, let's start with you. The mayor of El Paso has declared a state of emergency in response to the influx of migrants. What does that entail in your city? What type of resources does that free up? Good morning and thank you for having me. So I have been asking the mayor to declare a local emergency here in El Paso since May of this year. Um, and finally, finally, you know, a couple of days before Title 42 was set to expire, he decided to to follow that, that declaration. Um, what that means is that we will now be getting extra resources from the state of Texas. State of Texas has a deployed um, the Texas National Guard to El Paso. They will help us with the operations here in El Paso. However, my concern still remains that um, immigration is not a local issue, it's a federal issue. And it is important for that reason that the federal government really steps up and really does something about this. Um, to me, it almost feels with the new busing organiz organizing that they're doing is they're just really welcoming everybody and putting them on buses and sending them wherever there is. And if that's going to be the permanent process, then there needs to be a permanent operation set in place as well. Why did it take so long for this uh, emergency order to be put in place? Um, from what I understood, the White House had previously asked him not to do it. Congresswoman Escobar had also asked him not to do it. And so with them asking him not to do it, I'm assuming they put pressure on him. I know the county judge Samaniego also asked him not to do it. Um, it, it's, it was purely political and it's very unfortunate that they were playing politics with the people of El Paso and ultimately with the migrants themselves. So, Alan, let's get over to you now. Yesterday, Supreme Court ruling allows Title 42 to uh, remain in place for now, at least. So who benefits most from that decision? No one benefits from that decision. And Title 42 has been ineffective from its very conception. If the local council member said that they were asking for an emergency since May, Title 42 was in place, so migrants were still already coming to the southern border. So the concept that Title 42 is going to change something, perhaps the numbers, is just a farce and just a scare tactic to sort of infuse people. What the Supreme Court is doing now, which they didn't do with mass mandates or any other of the requirements of COVID, is holding at bay the executive power, which has been this big battle of federalism on immigration. So the council person is very right. This is an issue for federal government to decide and the, the body best to resolve this issue is Congress, and they haven't done anything for 30 years. And if they were to do something, then that would change. But I think it's important to note that 2.2 million people came to the southern border during the last year, and 1.4 million of them were expelled either either under Title 42 or Title 8. So people were being removed from the exterior of the country and not just accepted on buses to come to the United States. And as an immigration attorney, I must say always that asylum is a legal format to enter the United States of America. Alan, as far as uh, you, you're talking about the federal government intervening, I know you're a proponent of having Congress get involved. Uh, there was talk about a bipartisan immigration reform, but that seems to be stalled. This has been something on the agenda for yeah. years, but nothing has come from it. What would be a solution to this if there was no Title 42? All right. So. Title 42 shouldn't be involved at all. Regardless of if Title 42 still stays impacted, there are so many exceptions to Title 42. There's still going to be an influx of migrants to countries that cannot be returned. That's why you saw the uh, some 8,000 people that were accepted over the weekend into the United States. So the concept that Title 42 is doing anything, controlling the numbers, is a farce. So even without Title 42, what Congress can do, working with local government and private funding, is to help establish a system to meet our needs. Our birth rates are down. We have not accepted the number of refugees in the past. We're like 50,000 50, people down a year on refugees for the last four years. So that's another capability. And we have a high unemployment rate in the ag world. So we need to create a temporary work system that will allow these people to come in and meet the needs of the United States and maybe also return to their home countries. What is also not being talked about is earlier in the vice president's administration, almost six months in to being vice president, there was a private organization that funded billions of dollars to Central America to stop the push of immigration. So it's gonna take a lot of things and not just one solution. And remember, it took 30 years to build this problem and it's not gonna be resolved overnight. But what's most important is that we can't call these people illegal because they're not illegal when they're not in the United States. And if they're applying for asylum, they're in the legal process that is a right in the United States. 
And one of the things that Governor Abbott said was that we can't handle this influx of people. Well, let me help with that conversation because every day at DFW, they accept thousands of people from around the world and are able to process them. It's not about not being able to process them. It's about the choice of who you want to process. Oh, very good point there. So, Claudia, to you then, um, what is the solution? I'm assuming that it's going to be multi-pronged, just as Alan described. Uh, there is no one-size-fits-all when it comes to this, especially because it is a problem decades in the making. Uh, but, but to you, what is the solution, and how do you handle the influx of people possibly? So, I don't believe that the city of El Paso has the resources that, that Washington, D.C. has. Mm -hmm. um, we have been struggling here. And uh, Title 42, I agree, is not the solution to this, but it was a temporary band-aid and it was basically holding back a dam of water and it was it was bound to erupt. People are coming in anticipation of Title 42. People are under the, the understanding that they were being kept out of this country because of Title 42 and they're coming. And the city of El Paso has been given a federal responsibility are, we have nothing to do here with immigration law. All we're trying to do is provide public safety for our taxpayers. We're trying to provide them tax relief. We're trying to fix our streets. That's our jurisdiction. That's our purview. And the fact that we were giving this responsibility is completely disrespectful to our community. And I do feel that if, this, if there's anything that's going to be done, it has to be through Congress. We do have laws. But right now what's happening is complete chaos. It's not organized. And I mean, the people of El Paso are the ones paying the consequences, not Washington DC, not any other city. It's the city of El Paso and no one is helping us. Can you give us kind of an inside look of what it's like in mm -hmm. El Paso right now for someone who is crossing the border, the conditions that they're staying in? So I will say that the city of El Paso is a city of immigrants. Um, my parents are immigrants. My husband's an immigrant. I am a first generation Latina. And we went through a process. They worked very hard. And it is insulting to us to see what's going on, not just for me and my family, but people in the city of El Paso, because we all paid a lot of money. We all put in a lot of effort to go through the immigration process and to be here in El Paso. And what's happening right now, that's not it. And so I understand that claiming asylum is legal, but there is also a legal way of claiming asylum. And what's happening again in the border is not it. It's very unfortunate because people are being coming here. They're crossing the border. It is freezing. They're sleeping outside. They're running across our freeways. They're getting ran over. They're being killed. They're being trafficked. There is a lot more to this than saying, oh, no, you know, it's perfectly legal to be doing this. Right. But we need organization to do it. So, Alan, uh, before we go, the Biden administration says it's been working on plans to deal with uh, the ending of Title 42. Are you hearing anything on the ground um, as far as what those plans might entail? Sure. So I don't think anyone's going to be happy with the plans because I think it's going to be a mix of the former administration's policies and maybe some other policies. Mm -hmm. And so the way that I should speak to this first is to say that the chaos at the border was created by Stephen Miller. It's the design of Title 42. So that is exactly what it created was this chaos that exists. If there was no Title 42, we'd not be dealing with this influx of a, a policy potentially ending and the scare of potentially more people sort of coming. So what we hear from the Biden administration is faster processing of asylum, which may not always be a legal way to sort of do some cases for due process because they may not have the documents or the proof that's required to do that. An influx of officers at the southern border to sort of handle cases. And remember, even without Title 42, there was Title 8, which the government's able to expel people immediately with that influx of sort of doing that. So it should, it seems like it's going to be, no one's going to be happy with what they're coming up with, which isn't a solution for immigration code. And I think it's super important to talk about asylum because when we talk about asylum at the southern border for people who walk a thousand miles with their children to apply for asylum aren't worthy, but people who fly over every day into New York, stay one day, file for asylum are worthy. So if we're talking about asylum as a program, and how we're going to change it has to apply to everybody equally. And that's the problem with Title 42. It focuses on poor immigrants, brown and black immigrants. So it's a very focused, racist program that doesn't result in an immigration fix across the border of the United States. And while I understand the concerns of the local community, they should also look to their senators who have should have drafted some immigration reform, but have stood in the way of that reform consistently saying we don't need any immigrants here, when in fact they're one of the highest users of H2B visas for seasonal work within the state. Texas. All right, Eleanor Jr. and El Paso City Representative Claudia Rodriguez, thank you so much for joining us and providing us with a lot of insight here on this topic. We appreciate it. Thank you.